<clears throat> so when I, I some cams some and, I, and you <laughs> click down button and there's a gray, this is connecting, it's gray out, grayed out. So it's not, I think it's not, the driver for the video is not working. Uh, I think I started the broadcast somehow. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hopefully Armando comes back and fixes it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who's driving this semi truck? I don't know how to drive. <laughs> Shouldn't have given me the uh, privileges to mess around. I just said the broadcast is now starting. Yeah. All attendees are in listen only mode. Uh, uh, luckily, we got some time. Yeah. <clears throat> and is this is this actually the production uh, webinar instance, or are we going to go log into another one? Uh, In other words, our 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 uh, audience going to be joining us soon. I think this is the actual mm -hmm. one, Tony. But okay. I think. And then over on the right, where there's a microphone and then a webcam, it says, click here. It says, no one can see you. Click here to share your webcam. Well, I click it. Yeah, it doesn't that work. <laughs> That's right. No worries. All right, good. This is very interesting. I've, this is, I've never had this happen before. Uh, I even go to settings in my webcam. And in the settings or the preferences, it shows me perfectly. And then when I go back yeah. to go to webinar. It's like, hey, it's yeah, not What's that? Uh, I think I think I might have accidentally started the broadcast while you were uh, <laughs> gone. Oh. Uh, I was trying to become a presenter to, um, so I don't know, but I don't know how that. that oh, there's Lucy again. I'm well, not sure how that. Recorded. You know, I just yeah. had to go, I did that thing on the right, but then I had to go to the top also. Yeah, I tried that. Bar where you see the thing that says everyone and then the webcam thing up there between the people and the Zoom icon. Just, I, I, uh, I uh, stole some of this uh, material from other colleagues. Uh, it's just just to show you, we'll use the schematic uh, in the next slide, but, but we're talking about commercial large scale heat pumps. If you click one more time, I think it gives some definite, it gives a definition down below. There we go. So, you know, uh, uh, commercial and um, multifamily and in the commercial uh, sectors for dwellings and more. And, you know, both the, in terms of gallons and KW input power are important definitions that you'll see here coming up on the next slide. So today we're talking about large volume. Next slide, please. This is where I, I want to talk a little bit about CTA 2045. It is branded as an eco port. Um, it's essentially a port. Think of it as like a USB port on, a, on an appliance. It could be electric vehicle, a, a thermostat, an HVAC controller, a heat pump water heater, and, and a resistance water heater and so forth. So if I can get your attention, so uh, in Washington, let me, and actually uh, I'll give credit to Bonneville. We we did, a I, along with uh, Conrad Hustis, co-managed a large demonstration project in the Northwest uh, 2014 through 18, where we demonstrated the, the 2045 port on residential heat pump, on electric resistance and heat pump water heaters. And that report was quite successful in it. It drove uh, commerce in, in the state of Washington and then also in Oregon to create actually a requirement. So, and because of COVID, that requirement has been delayed a good year and a half or so, but we're at the end of that. And, and this is now the update on when this, this requirement goes into effect. It's both resistance tanks and heat pump tanks. Uh, but of the residential kind. So that's why the blue arrow shows from KW 120 gallon and less is where it applies. Larger than that does not apply. And so in Washington, it takes effect in January of 23. In Oregon, it'll be next July. So six, six months later, um, it requires a CTA 2045 port. Um, and then in California, uh, it requires them on heat pump water heaters. And it's, that is currently in effect. 
So that is the legislation that's driving, um, you know, the this port, and uh, it's very exciting the, to see that take place. It is not required in the large tanks, but today we we did get a port into the Bayview project, and so we're going to talk about that, how we how that came about. Next slide. Now this one is late breaking. Literally, we I got. This team got an email from Jeff Wicks, our great colleague at NIA, uh, sharing basically all this information. This is as of yesterday, folks. So we're not a news organization, but almost. Uh, so AHRI 1430 has been being worked on for a couple of years now. It is a, a demand response load shifting standard from that organization for uh, water heaters, both uh, resist, electric resistance and heat pump. And they've been uh, debating and, and working in that. Um, our colleagues have been part of those discussions. And finally, this was approved uh, recently. And so we are, it's now public information and we can share that. So it's very exciting. I provide a couple links here. And so there's the hot link. If this, uh, if that translates, Armando in the PDF or it, not. It will, for sure. For but sure. I so also gave you the text. I gave you old school text too, because I know that I've had links that don't work. So. Nothing like the www, copy and paste. Uh, these are really good links, folks. And so quickly, uh, Open ADR Alliance, of all things, they have agreed through the great work of NIA to be the, the 2045 uh, certification test organization, right? So they're in charge of, so if, if I'm a man manufacturer and I wanna make a port and I wanna get it certified that it works, I send it to the Open ADR Alliance for uh, testing and verification. So those folks now are uh, so the bottom the bottom link is is a little news release from them that shows the first two units and I believe it's Ream and American Standard <clears throat> that are officially uh, tested by that organization. So both of those sites those links give you a lot of information. Uh, about the Ecoport, which is the branding. Think of it like, a, you know, Wi-Fi. We call Wi-Fi what it is, but it's uh, IEEE um, number is the technical standard. Wi-Fi is the uh, business, uh, the market use of it. So Ecoport is going to be the way we refer to the port, uh, in you know, moving forward. Next slide. Hey, uh, Tony, Tony, I uh, have yeah. a, a quick question. I think, uh, and not sure that that we can speak to it much, but. Uh... Any reason why the the standard is being applied with this size of system and not with uh, larger commercial systems? Right. Um, yeah, and that is a whole nother uh, probably webinar worth. But um, the Ecoport, the, the the 2045 was always intended to be a, a direct um, communication to an appliance. So think of it as residential, small small commercial. We're giving a command to an appliance to do something. And when you get into bigger systems, uh, commercial, industrial, whatever, uh, you get into networks of systems. So uh, a so there you wanna talk to a controller uh, and, and typically that's gonna be an open ADR command. So open ADR and, and 20, CTA 2045 are great. They are very complementary, and typically think of them as sectors, you know, sort of, residential commercial large-scale commercial in general it, i mean and today we're going to talk about that we are using OP, open adr in this uh, bayview project as well so it doesn't mean you can't use it it's just their the main intent is for uh, unitary uh, self-controlled appliances that's the short answer well, so thank it, you very much for, for addressing the heat that. pump in the heat pump today even though it is you know, one more last point in the heat pump today it is a large uh you know it could be classified as commercial it's being controlled by its own brain it's not being controlled by the building management system for example that that's the distinction okay so here's a slide that uh if we go back over 10 years ago when we began when bpa began thinking hard about we want to have you know a, a heat pump an efficiency option in domestic hot water heating you know of large volume right non-residential and so it was basically the, the square in the middle. There was no proven commercially available product in the market at the time. So we said, we wanna change that. We wanna make, we wanna push the needle. So we chose a, uh, the 
the application of multifamily. So that's what the arrow means. We said we're going to focus on multifamily, and that's where we uh, began our efforts. And so now advance the next slide. We hop to to the present day, and here we have these products now that are available, you know, commercially available. So in different kind of sizes here, uh, and then we have, you know, on on the large scale we have CO2 product two manufacturers and then uh, non uh, you know traditional refrigerant uh, as well so so this is kind of you know through our efforts to focus and push uh, and and you know doing studies a whole bunch of different things have culminated to this point where we are today and so the motivation for uh, the project today was you know choosing uh, Mr. the Mitsubishi product and saying we want to push that um, and with collaboration with Ecotope to make that happen. And it's kind of our, our first, um, you know, heavy lift demonstration. So next slide is my last slide. And it, this is future looking. So we want to do some, we want to do another one. Uh, we don't know exactly where yet, which application or definitely will be a different, a different manufacturer. Um, but I will do a, a wink to the dairy facility. There is something afoot there. More later, maybe we'll we'll uh, mention that in a little more detail in uh, next May. And without Armando, over to you. Awesome. No, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, great to hear that that breaking news and the industry progressing as we should. And Bonneville uh, leading the charge to an extent. Uh, wanted to now introduce Scott Spielman, a researcher from Ecotope who's been working very closely to this project and uh, developed a, a solid amount of the content that we can share with you today on, on how the project came together, uh, some of the performance findings and benefits that we saw as well. Uh, so Scott, take it away. And if you can share your webcam, I think you were one of the ones that, that was spared. Uh, please feel free. Thanks, Armando. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide. So this slide shows on, I'm gonna start from a high level here, and on the on the right, this is these are three pillars that Ecotope sees as how we decarbonize the, the building sector. And then on the left is um, kind of this big idea that heat pump water heaters are really critical to, they're a, a cornerstone to decarbonizing the building sector. And that's because they fit into all three of these pillars really nicely. So for, for electrifying buildings, um, heat pump water heaters allow us to electrify domestic hot water systems at a lower connected electrical capacity. So that allows us to go in and retrofit gas buildings without having to update or, um, uh, make the electrical service bigger, which can add a significant cost. Um, energy is efficiency. Um, think, I think about this as every kilowatt hour that you save is a kilowatt hour that you don't have to produce. And um, hot water in multifamily buildings accounts for about a third of the energy used. And installing a heat pump water heater cuts that um, energy use by a factor of three. So it's a huge energy saver in residential buildings. It's one of the single largest um, energy conservation me measures that you can get from just swapping out one piece of equipment or updating one system. And then uh, when matters. So uh, <clears throat> as we move from uh, fossil fuel generating resources to uh, renewables and cleaner energy resources when we use electricity becomes uh, very critical because um, we can't always have the sunshine when we want or the wind blowing when we want. So buildings and systems need to become more flexible about when they can use energy. And with a heat pump water heating system, this large thermal mass that you end up having to is install to get the system to function properly, um, acts as a really nice thermal battery, which gives it demand response and grid flex flexibility. 
Uh, next slide. So as Tony mentioned, um, we've been, uh, EPDIP's worked with Bonneville Power Administration on this project. And uh, one of the, the things that Ecotope has been doing over the past uh, decade or so is working with manufacturers of emerging technology on that <clears throat> support decarbonization on a technology innovation model, which is shown here. Uh, the first two steps are feasibility study and applications testing, and those are essentially due diligence for a demonstration project. So um, if you want to click a couple times, it should. Yeah, so this project was, that's good, thanks. The demonstration project within our technology innovation model for the Heat 2.0, which is a Mitsubishi CO2 heat pump that Tony mentioned. And along with the demonstration project, we install additional monitoring equipment so that we can provide measurement and verification and learn lessons uh, that can be used on future installations. Next slide, please. Um, the collaboration on this project is really what, what made it possible and what made it happen, um, to get a new product or new idea into the market. Um, it really takes, uh, teamwork from a lot of different organizations. And so I've circled the organizations that were really critical to this project, Seattle Housing Authority. We, and this installation was done on a Seattle Housing Authority building and they um, were really critical to giving us access to the building when we needed um, working with us, funding the installation. Um, it really, we could not have done this project without Seattle Housing Authority. Um, and then Bonneville Power Administration, which has been working with Ecotope on the technology innovation model and bringing new products to market, was, has just been a critical player um, in this project. And they really drove a lot of the goals, um, especially around demand response. Mitsubishi, of course, uh, provided us with the equipment and worked with us on startup and uh, offered their technical resources to get everything running smoothly. Stephis is a manufacturer in North Dakota that provided a skid mounted system that allowed us to change over the hot water system with only about a half a day of hot water downtime because the whole skid came on a single package and we were able to just set it on the roof and pipe plummet into the existing system. Skycentrics um, was critical in the developing communication that we needed to run demand response testing through OpenADR and CTA 2045, which Tony touch, touched on, and we're going to share some results later. Uh, and then Seattle City Light, of course, has worked with us throughout the project, and um, it's in their service territory, and they've been uh, helping us fund some more advanced um, assessment of how the system's been performing thus far and talking over uh, how they might use a system like this. So that's been really critical. Uh, next, next slide. So I'm gonna run through some project goals really quick. Um, obviously we wanted to keep the hot water running to the tenants. We had a target performance of the CP of 2.5 we wanted to op identify some opportunities to improve the design, which is um, in all of our demonstration projects and, verif and measurement verification, we always try and figure out some way that the installation could be done better next time because we have the advantage of so many monitoring points. We wanted to demonstrate a package system approach where this uh, hot water system is comes pre-built and pre-packaged and set on the building for easier installation of the on-site contractor and we wanted to test load shifting and demand response next slide and i'll just cut right to the results 
so that we don't have to wait for them. Um, we have delivered hot water reliably to the building. There was one instance in which a pump in the skid failed due to a manufacturing defect and the system had to operate on backup, which um, worked worked well because we had to run on backup for a few months and we got that pump fixed and now it's operating great. Uh, the annual COP has come in around 2.3, which is a little bit below what we targeted initially, but one of the opportunities for improvement has shown us where we can make that up and um, improvements around uh, controls of the heat exchanger inside the skid, we believe could increase the COP to 3.2. Uh, we did successfully demonstrate the package system installation. You can see it there in the picture. Uh, that green skid was uh, delivered and lifted on top of the building during the installation. And load shift testing is in process uh, with some great results that I'm going to share later. Next slide, please. So um, I'll touch a little bit here on the building, the, the design for the system and the building. So this is a 100 unit uh, senior low income housing building, Bayview Towers, which has a slightly different load shape than a normal market rate building. You can see on the right is the, the two load shapes. The market rate is above and the senior housing is below. Um, I would also just note that the scale is a little bit off on these because the market rate building shown here on this graph is smaller, but the idea is the, or the uh, senior income, the low income housing building is smaller, so it's got lower GPM, but the, the main takeaway is that the market rate buildings have a slightly peakier shape, load shape to them, so that their um, usage periods are more highly concentrated to the morning and evening than the uh, low income senior housing buildings. We used a swing tank system when we in installed this uh, with parallel, parallel piped thermal storage tanks. Um, the systems, um, we've installed a swing tank, Ecotope's done many swing tank systems and they work well. Um, we This is one of the first times we've done a parallel storage tank piping and it is also working very well. Uh, something to note is the retrofit system. In the retrofit system, the primary heating sources draw about 17 to or 12 to 17 kilowatts typically um whereas uh, scott not sure if it's me but uh, we lost your your audio uh are you there I'm just double checking, uh, Tony or Lucy, do you guys hear Scott or, or is it just me? No, same experience. Um, me too. Uh, if you want to go to, uh, to my slides, I can help. Uh, I can just do my slides and we can come back to Scott when he comes back on. That sounds great. Thank you, Tristan. And I appreciate everyone uh, hunkering with us uh, live here with all of our, our fun technicalities. No problem. So everybody, my name is Tristan DeFondeville. I'm the CEO of Skycentrics. We specialize in sort of last mile communications to machines. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there's my contact information if people want to contact me. Uh, next slide. All right. So um, this is the control box that you're seeing on the right that was made by Mitsubishi uh, and that controls this skid of this equipment. So there's tanks. That's what Scott was saying. Skid makes it real easy to put and install. He'll give you more details, but that's the controller box 
that has the intelligence that that is on a lot of commercial building equipment. So uh, commercial building equipments typically have controlled boxes with some CPU, some some computer inside that is managing uh, the different sensors and on-off mechanisms to make things happen. In this case, hot water. And uh, we've been working with a lot of manufacturers uh, to bring what we're calling the Sky Kit into play that gives these control boxes, which have input and output, right? So there's a whole list of those that are possible. And Skycentrix has specialized in taking the grid signals, either of open ADR or through the EcoPort module or both, and bringing them to these control boxes. And it means that the OEMs can focus on what they've always done and just add a little bit of extra functionality inside the controls, which allows them to easily be told, use a little less energy, use a little more energy. Those are the key things. And then also to uh, essentially, besides use a little less and a little more, hey, communicate a little bit. Let us know that you are doing what we asked you to do and tell us a little bit about your power measurement, if ideally, how much power are you using? So those are really the key things to make a, a large electric load of piece of equipment be grid interactive. Uh, and it's exciting that we are having a software and hardware kit that can, can help uh, a lot of large electric loads become rapidly doing that. So there's a little bit more details there if you dig in, but let's go to the next slide. And uh, and w again, we're focused on open standards. Yeah, but no, back up one, thanks, if you could. All right, so what you see is that this Sky Kit, which sometimes is software only, doesn't have to be a hardware, uh, but obviously to make the eco port happen, that's an important difference, is the eco port is actually a hardware port, but sometimes we can use the hardware of the OEM Mitsubishi, in this case, proprietary box, and other time, and therefore just put software on there. Or we provide a box that can have the eco port built in. And then how do you talk to the machines? Well, you talk to them by Modbus or BACnet. By the way, I apologize if my video camera's not on. Here we go. <laughs> so we, we do this by Modbus or BACnet. Those are classic communication systems for big commercial loads that have been around for 40 years now. Um, they're a little bit old, but they, all the machines typically have them. But some machines don't even have that. They have relays, very simple relays that are used by thermostats, for example, or they have a zero to 10 volt connection. Again, very simple connection. And then finally, the most sophisticated that we expect these machines to have is MQTT. So our SkyKit can do all of that. And again, the OEM doesn't have to do much, just a little bit of changes in their controls and firmware to be able to accept the signal of use more energy or use less energy. Tell us if you're responding to that and uh, use uh, how much power are you using if possible. Next slide, please. So one of the key things to think about as if you're a utility or any kind of people evaluating the machines that are starting to be grid interactive is where is the 24 seven repeating schedule stored? In other words, yes, you're receiving grid signals, but sometimes that grid connectivity gets cut. And then the question is, does the machine go back to completely random behavior, which most commercial machines, your refrigerators, your water heaters, your thermostats, they, they make things go on and off in a completely random way. And, you know, we want to have a million of these in the field replacing coal-fired power plants. And at that point, those millions of devices need to be at least reliably doing something, not just going back to random behavior. So if the cloud connection gets cut off, they go into random behavior, that would be bad. So that's why uh, you want to really understand where is the repeating schedule stored so that if the, if the dynamic price that you're getting communication gets cut off, then at least it's responding to its last stored schedule and, and you're updating the schedule every day. So that's really important. The nice thing about the EcoPort module is it can store the schedule there. And, and that helps because sometimes these machines, like that controller box, doesn't always 
have a schedule. So residential water heaters don't have a schedule in place historically. These controller boxes for commercial electric loads do. So just a thought. Next slide, please. All right. So uh, I, I, then the last one, thanks. So here, we just wanted to point out how exciting this change was. So a big commercial building with 100 apartments would, if you put a water heater in each apartment, you would see uh, a 4,500 watt electric load for each apartment, that's 100 apartments, and that would be 450 megawatts, uh, kilowatts. And then the, the, because it was a central system in Bayview, it was already at 120 kilowatts. So it was about a third of that. Uh, so central systems are more efficient uh, and typically use less energy. But when we put in the heat pump from Mitsubishi, it went down to 25 kilowatts. So that's really exciting, right? You get massive energy efficiency. And it's fairly expensive to do those changes. But sometimes if people, their old system is dying, which happens, right, then they need a new system. They should be moving to heat pumps. So that's already, uh, they have to do it anyway. And at that the difference in price isn't that big. And we just want to emphasize that the connectivity piece, the adding uh, of the ability to receive a cellular signal compared to the expense equipment and the install cost is literally $500 to $1,000 for 10 years of connectivity. And as Scott will show you when he's able to get back, and I can probably slide in in a pinch if he's having trouble, is these loads almost completely shift away from the Seattle City Light, in this case, the utility, their system peaks. So if you preheat the water, which historically wouldn't be preheated, it would just come on after you shower in the morning, which is the worst time. There's a little peak on the, of the grid then. And then same thing in the evening when everybody comes home and washes dishes and does a lot there. So by preheating, and then completely turning the system off during the normal grid peaks, the customer doesn't see any difference, they have hot water, and the grid gets a massive benefit. But then you, you think, well, maybe we can just schedule that and it happens the same every day, but typically the grid really likes it when you can move that, those hours of complete shutoff by an hour or two in either direction. That really helps the grid because the grid has those peaks changing. So that's the big difference, and it doesn't cost much to add a little bit, to add that cellular guaranteed connectivity, uh, so that's exciting. So that's the last of my slides. If Scott hasn't come back on and you want he, me to continue, I could probably do it. Oh, thanks a lot, Tristan, and I just appreciate the flexibility and, and, and the fact that you know this like the back of your hand, uh, but but I, do get, I did get a word, Scott is, is back. Uh, so I'll, I'll, tie it, I'll try to tie it back, folks. Uh, we started hearing about the project uh, goals and the results. We were starting to get into the design. Then uh, Tristan got, got in got in there and gave us a solid conversation on the connectivity from after hearing from from the standard that, that Tony mentioned earlier. Uh, whoops, not from the beginning. But uh, now uh, I got a word. Scott, uh, is is this a place we want to pick up from? And I did get a couple of emails saying he was back, but but we're not hearing you, Scott. Are, are you on mute? And if not, uh, I may advance and take up Tristan on on onto his uh, generous offer here. All right. Uh, Scott, I think you're having some some issues with the audio. You were trying to mute me, or, or let me see. And if and if not, we'll carry on. Yeah, now technology chose chaos this morning. Uh, Tristan, if if I advance a slide here, would you be able to pick up and, and continue? Uh, Oh, can Scott, is that you? Now? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay, awesome. I'm sorry about that. My uh, computer just shut down while we were <laughs> in the middle of the presentation. Technology uh, has chosen chaos today, but hey, thank you for bouncing yeah. back. 
I uh, guess it wasn't all the way plugged into the wall and gave me about five seconds between telling me it was a battery low and turning off. Um, so yeah, I'll just pick up where I left off here. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, so here's a diagram of the, the system that we installed and the monitoring points shown there. Um, so we have uh, energy monitoring on the heat pump and the swing tanks. We have temperature and flow monitoring all around the system. We have really good temperature monitoring on the thermal storage battery, which is critical to understanding how the demand response is functioning and how much charge we have left in the tank to deliver to the building. Um, and if you wanna just click once, Armando, it's gonna circle, that is the heat exchanger assembly that I referenced earlier, that the we identified some control functioning that wasn't operating perfectly around, which is reducing our COP. And we've been, we brought this up to Mitsubishi and they are on it and developing some plug and play, really nice solutions that are gonna be available soon for uh, newer installations. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of a step back here and talk about some of the site considerations when uh, approaching this Bayview project, because it is a retrofit. And one of the key things with a retrofit is looking at whether there's um, electrical capacity already available. Um, at this site there was because it was electric resistance water heating originally and um, on other retrofit sites that are gas, sometimes it can be a little bit tighter. We also wanted to make sure we installed it in a location that would reduce and eliminate any sound that could be transmitted to the tenants. So that's where we chose the location we chose. Uh, we wanted to protect the equipment from potential vandalism or um, theft of copper components. So we put it on a roof that is not accessible above the electric the electrical room. And a structural engineer was hired to investigate the, the load potential of the, the, the roof there, which actually did limit the size of our thermal storage volume a bit, which was 855 gallons where we ideally from the sizing calculations with load shift included we wanted a little bit more than a thousand but we were able to use some controls to get load shift capability with even less um, storage than we originally thought next slide So here's uh, the modular design we used, um, just a couple photos of the skid being delivered and lifted onto the roof. Next slide, please. A couple more uh, images of what the modular design looked like on the right and the left is kind of a future of what this skid could look like if it uh, becomes a product, which Steph is, has been working on. Next slide. And um, when you're working with this type of modular design, these are some bullets on some important things to keep in mind as the engineer. It simplifies things immensely from the controls, designing the piping, um, all that perspective, because you can treat this as just a single piece of equipment um, where you just figure out your structural requirements, rigging to get the system in place, egress to get two things, electrical requirements, and then connections for potable water condensate and communication. Next slide. You can click here, we'll show. And so now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to talk about our load shift testing that we did. Um, heat pump water heaters naturally allow for load shifting because of the, the throughout all seasons. Um, which is also really nice because of the shape uh, that they, uh, the the load shape that hot water is used at, it is focused in peak periods, morning and evening. Most water is used in the morning and evening and uh, the thermal storage volume allows for a natural battery. Next slide.
Um, in, in order to talk about load shift and um, set capability, it's I do want to take a little bit of a step back to talk about equipment sizing. On the left, we have a building that was si with the heat pump water heater installed that was sized for uh, using the some older metrics for sizing, um, ASHRAE sizing methods, um, and the Hunter's curve. And then on the right is that same system sized using the methods that Ecotope has developed. So you can see um, the system on the right, and this is for the same building. So the system on the right has half the amount of storage and significantly, significantly less uh, cap output capacity. And the older sizing methods, um, especially with single speed equipment, can result in very unstable operation. This building on the left, Ecotip, was actually uh, hired to to fix, and and we ended up having to replace a lot of equipment, which was a shame because so much over it was so over designed that it wasn't functioning well. Um, so not only was it extremely expensive for the owner, but it didn't work well. Uh, next slide. Oh, hey Scott, we do have a a, a question. Well, comment or, or a question that came in about sizing. Uh, Mm -hmm. From a previous slide, or you had mentioned that there is about two to four gallons per minute. Uh, is there a possibility that the system or piping may be oversized? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, which which slide I mentioned? Two to four gallons per minute. Um, I recall that. Then. Then we'll then we'll we'll, we'll chart on. I, I was just more so reading reading the comment and uh, encourage. Hey Drew, okay. if you had a where you got the the two to four gallons per minute, let us know. Uh, oh, the okay. the low side you mentioned. Maybe I can but come yeah. back and answer that. Um, Sounds good. And now we can take it exactly. Yeah. So Ecotope um, has developed an online tool. Um, you can find at ecosizer.ecotope.com, which um, allows you to size for multifamily buildings really easily, just plugging in some basic information about the building. And then you can adjust this slider to adjust the uh, capacity to storage ratio, um, which is very helpful for, for design engineers wanting to look at installing heat pumps and uh, not to, to not oversize the system. Next slide. So the Ecosizer is based off um, lots and lots of measured data from field installations on multifamily buildings. And there are two main components that go into the sizing method. On the left, you have the load shape, and we take a design day, which is the peakiest load shape, which means the highest concentration of water is used in the, the morning and evening. Um, and then on the right, we have the overall volume of gallons per day, and the, we take a design load from that at the uh, 98th percentile, I believe. And you combine those two things, which I also think it's important to note that statistically, these two things, that peakiest design day and the maximum gallons per day, don't happen on the same day. Um, so you end up with a safety built into your your design calculation because you're sizing for both the peakiest day and the day with the most volume used at the same time, which in reality doesn't happen. But it does give you some extra storage volume and extra capacity that can be leveraged for load shifting. Next slide. And at Bayview, we um, employed some a load shift strategy to uh, take advantage of the full storage volume as much as possible while controlling to maintain hot water uh, is delivered consistently to the building. Um, and the, the way we did this was we, for each CTA 2045 command, we, we defined the Operating mode, which which um, defines which thermistor within the tank. There are five thermistors up the storage tank volume, and it defines which thermistor is 
use to control the heat pump on and off. Um, we defined a set point for the water heating system, and we did we defined a output capacity setting so the the QHV can operate in normal efficiency operation, which outputs 40 kilowatts of heat, or it can float up to 60 kilowatts of heat output in a high capacity setting. And so this has allowed us to, when we charge the tank during load up, we can increase the set point temperature, we can push the hot water further down in the tank, and we can do it faster by having the heat pump output more heat. This is sacrificed in a little bit of a efficiency sacrifice. There's a little bit of efficiency lost when this happens, um, although we haven't even been able to really tease that out of the data um, because it's so minor. And then when we shed, we can uh, allow cold water to fill up more of the tank from the bottom with hot water still floating on top, um, which just prolongs the time until the heat pump turns on again um, and allows us to ride through longer periods without turning on the system. Next uh, hey, Scott, uh, um, I think, and I think your last comments have addressed this, but we did have a, a question uh, come in saying, uh, for, for this load shifting application, why was the system designed with hot water storage tank tanks piped in parallel? Mm. Shifting, yeah. Yeah, what were these? yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, the, the parallel versus series tanks has been a little bit of a debate um, as to which which system uh, would be preferred. And uh, one of the big advantages to parallel is that each tank can be individually isolated um, without disrupting the, the operation of the system. So if you needed to isolate, drain a tank to clean it, change the anodes, do some kind of maintenance on it um, with parallel tanks. You can do that. It's it's um, great for maintainability. There's also um, some. It, it has it has slightly lower pressure drop through the tank system because you're not going through it in series with with pipe between each tank. Those pipes between tanks in series also are a great place to lose heat because um, uh, they're a thin column of water with less insulation. Uh, and there's it, the, there it's still kind of up for um, debate whether the stratification works better in parallel or series, but I think at a certain number of tanks, you can actually provide better stratification with with series because you don't have each tank kind of forming its own stratification layer uh, as uh, parasitic losses allow heat to to um, move out of the tank and water in the tank cools. So a couple of thoughts on there. Ecotope's actually written a report on thermal storage tanks, which um, is on BPA's website, which goes into more detail on that. Um, we can move on to the next slide, Armando. Thanks, if... thanks a lot, Scott. There was a couple other questions, but just in 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 uh, to mind the time, we'll we'll move on and I'll and I'll look to ask them uh, at the latter part of our of our webinar. Okay. Okay. Great. So here here's kind of the real um, results from our initial MNV uh, on demand response testing. So you can see in green that's how the existing system operates. Um, Pretty high kilowatt hour draws. These are average kilowatts, kilowatt hour draws. And I will say that with the uh, electric systems, uh, you get a lot more variability. So you could get up to a 60 kilowatt draw on some days during the peak periods. Um, and then in blue is the, the retrofitted system without demand response. And in green, and it, or I'm sorry, in red is the retrofitted system with demand response. So you can see in blue, you just get a lot of efficiency, which reduces your um, peak demand over those peak periods, which are 6 to 9 a.m. and 6 to 9 p.m., which are pretty easy to see in this plot based on where the red line goes to base to zero. Um, 
and with when you add on load shifting um, you just cut out all energy used during those peak periods which is pretty awesome that we were able to uh, demonstrate it so successfully and such a high percentage of the time we were able to fully load shift and not turn on the system at all um, next slide and th this shows uh, accumulated energy used over the morning and evening shed periods for the electric resistance system the um, and the QHV, the retrofitted system with no load shift in red, and then the load shift in green. And so you can see we, just by switching to a heat pump water heater, we reduced that peak energy used significantly by a factor of about three. And then adding on load shift, you reduce it to essentially zero. Uh, and I believe that is my last slide. Thank you very much, Scott. Before we move on to uh, Seattle City Lights, heat pump water heating programs, incentives, and support, a uh, couple couple of technical questions uh, tying tying back to the to the design and, and the storage tanks in parallel. Uh, question is, was the charging and discharging of the tanks absurd to be pretty even when they were yeah designed in that way? Yes, um, they were, and we piped them in reverse return to try and increase that. And we, we we did a couple things to try and make sure the tanks balance. We piped them in reverse return, and we minimized the pressure drop between tanks, which allowed them to thermal siphon back into equilibrium. Um, so I would say that the, Oops. of course, they're not Sorry. Per perfectly, perfectly balanced but they are balanced enough that it's uh it's it's not i don't see it as a big deal at all that they're uh, you know a couple degrees off between the tanks in this at the same elevation very nice uh and, and last one for you and i'm moving on uh how are you maintaining stratification uh as in where does uh, the recirculation tie into the tanks? So recirculation ties into the swing tanks and not the primary storage tanks. And that's one big way we get stratification. And that's critical for CO2 systems because they need as cold as possible of incoming water. So if you push that recirculation back into the primary storage, you um, can really severely decrease the efficiency of a CO2 heat pump. Um, the, and as far as ways to increase stratification, we have, des we designed with this one, we custom designed the tanks to have internal, um, kind of sparge baffle like fittings on the top and bottom so that flow is redirected from vertically to horizontally and the velocity is less than three feet per second which keeps the straight tank stratified i i also do want to note that um return to primary system on co2 um while i kind of acted like it's it's not a good idea um it's i don't think it's impossible i think at some point we will be able to make that work um by uh, designing the electric, the recirculating system well and um, making sure that the recirc water coming back into this primary storage, most of the recirc water, yeah, thanks for pulling up this diagram. If we make sure most of the recirc water goes to that electronic mixing valve and a tiny amount of it goes back to the swing tank or primary storage, um, and the heat pump, CO2 heat pump is designed appropriately, I think um in the future we'll be able to get return to primary working well with heat pumps but currently this swing tank design is just so much more reliable and it also keeps your primary thermal storage tanks very well stratified which is um really really important for load shifting so 
Thank you uh, very much, Scott, for, for addressing these. And uh, thank you all for, for writing your questions in. Very, very appreciated. And, and the relevant ones, asking them live. Some we are uh, addressing via the chat. But continue in writing your questions. Uh, they're keeping the, the webinar uh, moving and engaging. Uh, now I want to switch gears. We've heard from, from BPA on how the project was, was formed. We've heard from Scott on, on the details for the project and what we've observed and load shifting. I've uh, heard from Tristan on the CTA 2045 connectivity. Uh, now I want to introduce Phoebe Warren, one of our senior energy management analysts, part of our program delivery team, to talk a little bit about our, our heat pump water heating uh, programs with multifamily and new construction. Uh, Phoebe, take it away. Says you are still muted, Phoebe. Uh, Hello, thank you. Um, there you go. <laughs> uh, thank you for all these excellent presentations. City Light uh, introduced uh, six years ago a simple dollars per living unit rebate for heat pump water heater systems in multifamily new construction. And um, I want to go over today how that type of funding works and also uh, discuss funding for heat pump water heaters via whole building approaches. So next slide, please. At this time, the funding available for CO2 heat pump water heater systems in multifamily new construction is $500 per living unit, which translates to 50,000 for 100 living units or 100,000 for 200 living units. Um, this is only available where the code uh, allows electric resistance baseline. And that is essentially uh, no longer possible in most cases. So we're talking about projects permitted under the 2015 Seattle Energy Code. And quite a few of those projects are still coming to us for funding. An agreement needs to be signed um, before construction uh, is completed. And then payment is issued once the system is fully uh, fully commissioned. And next slide, please. So because the code is becoming more stringent, uh, what we really need to do is create a measure by measure funding that uses a heat pump baseline uh, for higher efficiency systems, but we don't have that yet. So in the meantime, we're focusing um, increasingly on whole building type analysis, wherein uh, you might get credit for a heat pump water heater system that's more efficient than the code baseline. And here are the whole building approaches that are simplest through our program. If you go through Passive House, it's a flat $900 per living unit. Built Green, five star $900 per living unit. Built Green, four star $350 per living unit. Or as you know, um, the building department currently has uh, a green building program and has had one for many years, whereby um, you could maybe go back one slide. Thanks. Um, whereby if you go through a total building performance C407 analysis and demonstrate that the building's 15% more efficient than is required by code or perhaps 25, you may get additional height and uh, floor area available. And we would also support that type of project with energy conservation funding. Uh, next slide, please. So in the future, we're going to be changing our program um, to keep up with the times. And one of those changes is likely to emerge this coming spring, whereby City Light would pay for uh, modeling by a consultant paid directly by City Light to help support early design decision making and funding amounts for projects that go beyond code. Um, and that opportunity is likely to be available for any customer that doesn't yet have a contract for a particular project and will perhaps be the sole 
uh, path available after the first of the year. It's not quite sure yet. Um, and then in addition to that, we're also looking at uh, creating a simple flat uh, funding for heat pump water heaters, whereby uh, we can support efficiency levels beyond the code heat pump minimum. And I think uh, in that in that work, we're probably going to build on the NIA Ecotope and BPA uh, efforts on the advanced heat pump water heater specifications and tiered QPL for central heat pump water heater systems. Next slide, please. If you're interested in funding for a heat pump water heater system uh, in multifamily new construction, please contact us through our energy advisors or anyone else you've worked with on our team. And we look forward to working with you. Thanks. Awesome. No, thank you very much, Phoebe. Uh, appreciate uh, noting uh, where we are now and what the future may hold. And, and again, uh, for questions on, on, as Phoebe mentioned, heat pump water feeders and, and just other program questions, great resource to reach out to over here uh, as well. No, uh, so appreciate everyone who's who's presented on on this project and the topic uh, at hand now i wanted to switch gears a little bit and ask all our speakers uh, and then those that have webcam avail availability please turn it on uh, we're going to be asking a couple of questions live here to to, to get some more uh, informal unstructured uh, golden nuggets of wisdom from from the speakers here that have been tied very closely to this project uh, as the audience uh, please continue to chime in with your questions or comments and, and uh, relevant ones will be addressed live. I uh, wanted to give a quick start out and, and showing the, the images of, of four of our panelists. Uh, I'm missing uh, Phoebe and, and myself there. Uh, but I wanted to ask the question more so, hey, how have you from Seattle City Light, Bonneville Power Administration, Ecotope, Sky Centrics benefited from this pilot? But I wanted to first ask uh, Lucy Huang, she is from Seattle City Light and has, has not uh, had a section to present, but she has joined the project uh, earlier this year, last or, or late last year. And uh, yeah, if you want to see share with us a little bit how you got involved and, and what you've been getting out of it, uh, Lucy. You may still be on mute. I just heard I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? There you go. Yes, we can. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so City Light was really happy to be part of this project and um, benefit from all the great work and groundwork that BPA and Ecotope have already laid um, on the whole topic of heat pumps. You know, BPA has done a lot of work with heat pumps. Um, Ecotope developed the Ecosizer, and I believe Skycentrix has done a lot of work with controls. Um, so we knew about the efficiency benefits of heat pumps in general, um, especially compared to electric resistance. But the exciting thing about this project was the opportunity to get measurements for the load shift ability. Um, so for the first time, the City Light um, integrated resource plan that was presented to City Council includes um, demand response type loads, so load shape, load shifting to meet um, capacity and so forth. So this was an exciting opportunity with all the groundwork laid um, to get these really precise measurements. And it's really, um, we also love the fact that it's at Bayview Tower, which is a Seattle Housing Authority low-income senior um, housing facility, so it addresses our equity um, goals as well. Um, so measuring, as you saw when um, Scott presented the load shapes for, um, I don't have access to the slides, but when he showed the slides, I don't know if you can go back, Armando, um, back when he was showing the shape of the water use um, for is it this Maybe. slide or, or uh, earlier? Or this one? No, keep going back, back. Slide 18. 
It's like 18, Armando. Yeah, that one. So, oh, so when you look at the um, load shape on the graph on the right on top, which is the average um, hourly use profile, that actually somewhat mirrors the whole grid, <laughs> the whole electrical grid for Seattle City Light. So you can see that shifting the load from those peak hours that we're experimenting with at Bayview Tower can really um, reduce that peak that we have to satisfy and move it to the dip between midnight and six. So we have a lot of extra capacity at that time. So to take up the energy at that time and ride out that peaky area between six and nine. And then again, there's a dip in the use midday. And in the meantime, California has a lot of solar that they're trying to uh, shift off of their grid um, to be able to use. So then we can use that power again to try and um, ride through the evening peaks. So that's really exciting for us. And to be met and to be able to measure it like with all the instrumentation that Ecotope has, then we can um, normalize it with gallons uh, per hour usage and try and apply it to other building types and scale it across our region and see what we can accomplish. So. Well, thank you very much for, for that insight. Uh, wanted to open up uh, Tony, Scott, or, or Tristan, uh, if you can brief, if you briefly wanted to share, hey, how have, have you guys uh, just benefited from being part of this project? And uh, we'll move on to the next question after that. Let's see if we're having, I'm assuming we're having some, some sort of a issue with the muting. I'll see if I can help a little bit on that. Um, I I just want to mention that one of the big benefits that I've had is um, some of the connections that I've made with the different folks involved in this project. Um, it's been really great to hear all the different perspectives about um, what's from from the manufacturers um challenges to the utilities challenges and how those things can be kind of harmonized and connected towards meeting the same goal um and one of the big examples of that is just how um load we we um, were able to show make make load shifting happen on this building um and get through some of the manufacturers kind of concerns and challenges around how to control the thermal storage and have that result in uh, potentially what could be developed into a really big, large benefit for um, utilities around the country. Hey, Armando, this is Tony. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, good. Go back, actually, go back to page 18 real quick. Um, and I just want to point oh, yeah. out Thanks. Yeah. For me, so I came into this. Um, so the, the initial uh, push was for efficiency, CO2, heat pump, you know, the COPs that Scott was talking about and all that. And I focus in my job, I'm more of a DR person and part of what I do. And so I came in when we started engaging Mitsubishi to uh, introduce the load shifting capability. So and that's when Tristan, so Tristan and I, I kind of brought Tristan to the table to, to engage there. So I want to, first of all, huge kudos to Mitsubishi and their engineers, also their management for agreeing to do this. But then when we got into the engineering discussion, it was just great. Uh, and Tristan had the right pieces and, you know, we did all that. That was super exciting to see that come together organically, you know, public sector, private sector working together to further this thing. And you instrument the heck out of this thing you learn from it and then you share that, right, for next iteration. So, so the sharing is, so I wanna point out here, um, the heat exchanger, right, on the, moving from left to right, that heat exchanger is, is a new piece of equipment that has had to be added because it's a US install. So that's not a Mitsubishi requirement. So those are the kind of things you run into, uh, you know, as a code requirement of some kind, because the, whatever, the, there wasn't a double barrier or something. Uh, but those are the kind of things that we're dealing with in the U.S. code. And then Scott leveraged existing resistance tanks. We kept some of them in there uh, for the swing tank, but they have resistance elements. So another potential improvement would be to, to make sure that that gets 
that the, the swing tank makeup heat is is heat pump also so Bayview on on one hand is you know it's bold new uh, moving forward but there's a couple things that we can still learn from uh, the whole sizing thing and those discussions about how to plumb the tanks how much tanks so that's been my summary is it's been it's so great to see all the learnings that we're doing here and then we're going to get the stuff on paper and then share it so that future installs uh, become better and we learn from this. Thanks a lot, Tony. And uh, just at the sake of time, I'm going to go on to the next uh, question, bringing us back here. And uh, thinking uh, we didn't hear from from Tristan in the in the previous questions, but hopefully we can hear from him to, uh, on this one. As connected heat pump water heater, heater, heaters are becoming more ubiquitous trend, and now that we hear that the standard has passed, how do you feel this transformation and the CTA 2045 requirements will be received in the market uh, by industry? And again, anyone can answer, but but uh, yeah, looking if we can start with you, uh, Tristan. <laughs> Uh, says you are unmuted, but uh, you can chime in if if, if that uh, gets resolved. Yeah, anyone else that may want to chime in on this one? Okay, Tristan, you can you can bump in when, but I, I want to do my little piece on this when. So I want to take folks to the CETA, right? Uh, the uh, Clean Air and Clean Energy Transformation Act, State of Washington. Governor Inslee signed that back in 19, 2019. That's when our report on water heaters that we did, a big regional report was coming, uh, had been released and done. And I could not believe my eyes when I read that law that said by 20, 2045, all the state of Washington's electricity must be carbon free. I go 2045, that's our CTA 2045. And so, and actually, it, you know, curiously enough, that statute is where uh, the requirement for water heaters to have the Ecoport uh, is embedded in that law. Okay, and then Commerce, you know, made all the requirements <clears throat> of when it took effect. So I just want to leave you folks with that idea that um, it's a hard push and it's a hard ask of manufacturers to put uh, a technology in there that isn't driven by the market or requested by the market. Customers don't know or want that port but utilities do and so it's a very difficult chicken and the egg we finally have an egg i'm going to call it an egg the port and as that those equipment begin to roll in into into the years and decades you know the, and we have say 10 20 years from now we have all of washington's electric uh, tanks with a port it's super powerful uh, because we know that to get a clean energy we're going to need to do renewables and specifically pv probably be the dominant uh, thing. It is so easy to move morning water heater energy into the midday when PV is highest, even in winter, uh, and in the evening, push it into the night, you know, for wind or what have you. But even the hydro system loves to see load at night. So uh, I think it is, a, it is a highly synergistic situation having uh, water heaters enabled to load shift uh, in the coming decades where we need to be carbon free in addition to BVA Hydro, by the way. All right. Very solid. Appreciate the excitement, uh, Tony. And any other thoughts, uh, Lucy or Scott? I would add that um, now with the Inflation Reduction Act, providing incentives for um, energy efficiency and so forth, I can see a lot of parties um, being interested in installing heat pumps and heat pump water heaters to, to have this code requirement to have the communication port um, installed. And like Tony mentioned, people aren't even thinking about it or care about it, but the fact that if they'll install the heat pumps and they're already there, that um, really helps bring us into the future for any um, future requirements or um, advancements we wanna make to help our grid, as well as um, City Light also has a time of day rate often program coming out in 20, let's see, 20, 2024. So I think that's um, a good coincidental timing as well. 
Very nice. Yeah. Uh, and very good to know the time of use rates in 2024. So yeah, the, the, the future is coming in, in very exciting times. Uh, going in then to this next question, and, I, and we've mentioned a couple of times that the instrumentation that Ecotope used, but this is more so for projects uh, br more broadly. How can the load shifting strategies be implement that are implemented in this Bayview Towers project scaled and optimized for other buildings that may not have the MNV instrumentation available that this pilot had? I, I can address that too. Uh, but, please. please. Yeah free to chime in, but I think because of the instrumentation this pilot has, then we we are able to quantify what's available and what's possible for load shifting for different size. Um, hoping we can, like I said, with all the measurements and with all the brains of Ecotope and PPA and so forth behind this project, we can then normalize um, the results and say for you know such and such, for every unit of a multifamily building, this is how much um, load shift we can get as far as capacity and then scale it. Um, and then that helps if we want to develop any programs, what we can, um, what we could offer perhaps to encourage customers to, to do the load shifting. Um, and I say also, we are actually, the city light is rolling out, speaking of into the future next year, a demand response pilot, um, not with multifamily, but with single family um, thermostats and hot water heaters. Um, so I could see this, again, providing good information. And then we're also doing a DOE grant uh, with multifamily low-income buildings that will probably include central heat pump water heaters. So this, this information will be valuable for that as well. Uh, Towing said it at the very beginning, we're not a news organization, but uh, sharing a, quite a bit of uh, awesome news, uh, demand response, <laughs> pilot next year, time of use 2024. Uh, Phoebe shared some of uh, our, our future looking uh, program and rebate thoughts on uh, multifamilies, new constructions. Uh, obviously we shared about that uh, standard. So very, very, very yeah. exciting things. Uh, were you gonna mention something on, on this one, uh, Scott? Uh, I was yeah, just gonna say uh, something, Armando. This is Tristan. Oh, hey Tristan, welcome back. <laughs> hey, yeah. You know, Scott can speak to it, but he's been working with Mitsubishi to make sure that even though there won't be all the sensors in place, there'll be enough to certainly be able to do, I think, the M and V and everything else. And then obviously we've been working with the Sky Kit to provide both CTA 24 VR and all the data uh, that, that's being used. So uh, I think that, that, that there's a lot of good solutions that are coming out that will still be able to do uh, enough m and v that's required let alone the load shifting etc so it's an exciting time and mitsubishi for example has asked us to you know make a box that easily connects as a separate little SKU. Uh, that's that's sort of the commercial market version of what we put in place for this project uh, so mitsubishi is going to have a sky centric SKU that gives their equipment Open ADR and CTA 2045, so that's super exciting. No, I like it, and, and uh, not, not that it will we'll give you additional time to, to answer, just for the sake of time here, but uh, more, uh, I had an image in the previous slide, more so like, hey, looking at the at the port to connect to the to the water heater and all that good stuff. Uh, so yeah, no, uh, plug and play. <laughs> um, Wanted to then go on to this uh, hey, Armando? question. Armando? Go ahead, Tony. Yep. Yeah, one more one more quick comment back on that slide. I just wanted to say. Please. That, the, yeah, I, just again, I think this is important level setting. Even though the, the, the Ecoport is a requirement in the state of Washington, all those kind of things where these are just the beginnings and we have the best intent with the required commands in there, but it also, there's going to be a maturity of the technical folks working with manufacturers, utilities, what have you, these working groups, to get to a point where we have a nice, um, you know, a, a compromise between too much data and cost and enough, right? And so I just, I just want to tell folks that within the CTA 2045 command set, a very easy to do and and and, and a basic thing that we can, that the utility can get back if you have two-way communications is your operational state or your KW 
your instantaneous KW right now. So in other words, utilities can actually do M and B in a mature, high volume, mass market environment in the decades to come by gathering that data back and saying, well, well did you operate during my window or not? You know, and potentially have a penalty if you operated during the window you weren't supposed to. So even within the, the EcoPort, the simple communication of the appliance reporting back, whether it's running and at what level, is is a it, poor man's MMV in the mass market. I promise that so, I was laughing, but I was muted. <laughs> poor yeah, man's and, MMV. and I just want to add one more thing to that, which is, no, sorry. I just want to add one more thing, which is that 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 the uh, God, I'm on two red bars. It's so hard, but um, the you know that 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 kind of sky kit, and there will be other products like it. Enable well, all we ask is that an OEM do a has the capability to use less energy, more energy. Confirm that it's responding to the grid signal, and then finally deliver a decent power estimate of the power it's using. That's literally the only four things, and and so the minute the OEMs can do that, they can be a grid interactive load, and and they're getting very excited to do that, especially with these larger commercial loads. So I think it's really going to be exploding thanks to the support of BPA, Seattle City Light, Ecotope, and others. That's really helping move this this whole thing forward to the world that we need. Thanks. Oh, thanks a lot for for those added details, Tony and and Tristan. This is going to be our last uh, technical question here. Uh, and, and Tony, as you mentioned, uh, hey, what's too much information? Uh, more so the observation that, hey, between heat pumps and heat pump water heaters, there's a lot more uh, specifications. We'll see tiers. We'll see like SEER or HPF2 ratings. Uh, we're, there's going to be an advanced water heating initiative, QPL. Uh, so, so more so, hey, with, with all of these updated uh, specs, QPLs, standards, um, do you think that the market contractors, installers, plumbers are going to is, is is it going to be well received? Is it going to be too much? Want to pick your brains if you see if you have any comments on that. No, no need to be shy now. <laughs> I can I can start off um, this one for us. Thank you. Um, I think heat pump water heaters are an emerging technology entering the market and so there's an effort being made to create different specifications and um, product lists to align the market and create goals for what we see as a, um, a good product worthy of incentives for installation um, and that overall is is good i think you know goal setting for the market is is a great um thing to be doing and it will produce better products and standardized products uh, when we create too fine of a patchwork of different specs and codes and requirements it can become difficult for manufacturers contractors to navigate so I think the focus um, needs to be on aligning different parties that are developing these standards and making sure that um, we keep things simple um, for people and um, set goals that we can all agree on uh, to make sure that the heat pumps we're installing are as good as they can be. No, thank you, Scott. And I'll, I'll even, uh, I see that you came on muted, Lucy. Were you going to add to that? <laughs> I was just going to agree with Scott, <laughs> what he says um, about having more simplified uh, levels of uh, standards. But I think overall having standards in general helps um, people know what to shoot for. And then if we develop programs, then um, there's there's targets and it's easier to identify, you know, what what we expect to see. No, definitely. Thank you all. And, and we are pretty much at time here. So I, I, I encourage uh, audience to ask questions throughout and I appreciate you guys did. If there are any burning ones and uh, I know we're about to run out of time, 
Uh, so not to keep you here further, feel free to continue engaging with us, emailing us, lightingdesignlab.com uh, on our website, uh, soon to be rebranded. But just wanted to thank all of our, our panelists and speakers here. Again, uh, Tony from Bonneville got us a, a, a good start on this project. Uh, Scott with Ikato, very, very much tied to it, working with Mitsubishi and, and, and the site. Uh, Tristan on the connectivity. Phoebe, thank you for, for providing some information on, on the current and future programs, as well as the energy advisor's contact information. Uh, Lucy, again, uh, more so the Seattle City Light point of contact for this project. Uh, so, yeah, wanted to thank everybody for participating and, and sharing a good amount of knowledge here. Uh, feel free to, to get the, the handout and recording of the video. And as you leave, please enter that 30 second survey. Uh, and with that, We'll be calling it a time. So again, thank you everyone for joining. Hope you have a great rest of your day.